When we think about education, we often think of sending our kids off to school or college, but education encompasses a much wider concept that has existed since very early humans, perhaps even longer. Sharing knowledge and skills with children, either because they needed a skill to create tools or to help encourage wonder about the world, has always been a strong human mark. At times, people have tried to mechanize the entire process for efficiency, like teaching a language that required a set of rules, or personal gain, like teaching children how to become workers to be a more integral contributor to a particular culture. Today's education is so embedded into the monetary system that it's almost impossible to separate the two. You now spend 12 to even 20 years or more studying to mainly become a worker to pay your way through life on planet Earth. I spent 13 years in school and college, and to this very day I still wonder why. I personally hated school and feel like it did not educate me at all, but this is not a war that I am taking alone. In addition to almost all the people I know who share the same feeling, many scientists, teachers and experiments have reached the same conclusion. School in its current form is obsolete. So why do we need teachers and disciplines anymore? I learned to drive a car by practicing with my father, I learned English from movies, from chatting with other English speaking people, and from what I read. I learned through trial and error how to build good websites on my own. I even learned to swim on my own. Riding a bicycle, using a computer or other electronics, making jokes, understanding how people behave, what is a planet or a galaxy, what's good to eat and what is not, how to take care of the stuff you own, repair my computer, use a smartphone or any computer software and games, interacting well with other people and pretty much anything else of value to my life and living, I learned on my own from my personal life experience. None of it was organized or highly structured and no real discipline was needed, as it evolved by just being exposed to various needs, situations and information. Imagine a child needing to take special classes to learn how to play a game, whether an online game or hide and seek. Of course it sounds ridiculous to suggest putting kids through all of that, so then ask yourself why do we force them to take classes to learn chemistry or mathematics. I played football, soccer in the US when I was a kid and I played a lot. My friends and I were always on the football field from early in the morning until the sun disappeared from the sky. We made the teams and we learned and respected the rules all on our own. We even organized small championships, sometimes we focused on practicing free kicks or other football skills, but every time we did it from pleasure and a strong personal desire to improve our skills, not because we were made to do it. In contrast to that, some of us were also members of the school football team, or even better, the town football team. It seemed like a privilege, but it was nothing like that. Indeed, it felt good to know that I was on the school team, but it didn't feel good to experience it. Overall, there were more practices than games. We were made to wake up at a certain hour and go to practice, and after practice was over, many times we hadn't even played any football. When we did, we were all so tired that no one felt any pleasure in playing it. I was wondering all the time, what am I preparing for and what is the purpose of all that? Okay, I did learn a few more football tricks from the coach and a few free kick tricks, but was that all? All that practice for such minor details? My football skills did not improve overall because of all that practice, nor did my appetite for football. If anything, the contrary is true. This was the moment when I began to question the point of such organized discipline. If we can organize each other in a manner that suits us all, and we create positive enjoyable results because of that, why add this rough training? 
I loved football and I played it pretty well, but all because I played from pleasure, when I wanted, how I wanted. Perhaps the training would have helped if we were allowed to work as actual football players, have three to four games a week and as a result needed to be in good shape to cope with all that effort. This is a very good point to consider because this is what school does with physics, mathematics and biology. It makes the training tough and provides no practice at all, only to prepare you for a potential entry-level job. What if you let people play with those topics without telling them when and how to? Or even better, what if there were no separate disciplines like physics, mathematics or biology studies and instead we relied directly on life experience, which is continually becoming more and more knowledgeable and scientific as we progress? It probably sounds far-fetched, but stay with me. I will try to explain how it could work much better than today's approach. I remember how curious I was when I was 11. I asked my father all sorts of questions. How does a video camera work? What is the biggest animal ever to exist? How many people are in the world? I also remember the holidays when we would travel long distances and my father had a map with him. Basically guessing what would be the best track to follow. We stopped from time to time to figure out the best route to our destination. My mother knew many food recipes, from cakes to dinner, it was always a winner. She even had an old book from my grandma with many such recipes and when she needed help, she would ask a friend or just improvise. She even taught my sister and I how to cook certain foods. Although my father had some good answers to my questions when I was curious and he always reached the destinations when we traveled, and although my mother knew many food recipes and taught us how to cook some basic foods, the approaches they relied on are all obsolete now. This is not because I want it to be so, but because we now have computers and the internet. Whenever I wonder about anything, I search on one of the many search engines and I will get a very knowledgeable answer for everything. If I want to research a destination, I will use one of the many online or offline map navigators. Not only will I learn what roads to follow, it will also guide me step by step all the way through to my destination. Plus, if I ever want to cook something, the internet the internet is so full of recipes that you can easily learn how to cook a chicken 2,000 different ways. And even with all that at our fingertips, it doesn't take away from the human experience. With the internet and the many devices designed to access it, people become more knowledgeable and of course the feedback we receive from our fellow humans is continually improving with our increasing knowledge. The internet is a great example of how people can teach each other pretty much everything without strict classroom schedules or structured rules. From how to create websites and code programs to how to make your own solar panels or how to ski, you can find anything you want to know in multiple flavors. This ability has given rise to mutants, the ones who didn't follow the rules of the educational system, yet have created tremendous value for humanity by educating themselves. An example of a mutant is Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a collaboratively edited, multilingual, free internet encyclopedia supported by the non-profit Wikipedia Foundation. Wikipedia's 43 plus million articles in 250 different languages, including over 5.3 million in the English Wikipedia, are written collaboratively by volunteers around the world. Almost all of its articles can be edited by anyone having access to the site. It is the largest and most popular general reference work on the internet, ranking 7th globally among all websites on Alexa and having an estimated 500 million monthly readers worldwide. Wikipedia was launched on January 15, 2001 by Jimmy Wales and Larry Sanger. Wikipedia's departure from the expert-driven style of encyclopedia building and the presence of a large body of unacademic content have received extensive attention in print media. In 2006, Time magazine recognized Wikipedia's participation in the rapid growth of online collaboration and interaction by millions of people around the world, in addition to YouTube, Reddit, MySpace and Facebook. 
Wikipedia has also been praised as a news source due to articles related to breaking news often being rapidly updated there. A 2005 investigation in Nature showed that the science articles they compared came close to the level of accuracy of Encyclopedia Britannica. Imagine instead of writing your homework for school, which will be lost eventually, that you write up articles for Wikipedia. A lot of students feel that their learning in school is, is kind of useless because they put all of this effort and time into coming up with a great research paper and they turn it in and it just ends up in somebody's drawer. But with a Wikipedia assignment, they put it onto the article on Wikipedia and thousands, if not tens of thousands of people end up seeing their work. Uh, no, I don't have superpowers. At all. No. You could, you could totally do it. I pushed the button and saved the text. Woo! <laughs> it was uh, exciting. You just changed Wikipedia. You just added your own contribution to Wikipedia. I read an article in The Guardian about this online encyclopedia which everybody can contribute to. And I thought, whoa, maybe I can contribute too as well. I edited it the first time and I think I got addicted to it. I don't get paid anything. I just do it for, you know, something to do in my free time, that's it. You may start doing it for an idea because you believe in it, but you end up with friends, you end up with uh, lovers, you end up with uh, wonderful discussions, you end up with new ideas, you end up with the new books you're going to write. You're not writing the article alone. You write a piece and somebody else goes like, hey, I have more, and together you can create articles that are pages long, which you can't buy yourself. Then you have success. You always see, okay, what I've done was successful. And this is one of, this is great because, so editing is, is a great feeling every time you do it. As I say, when I read about Wikipedia, I decided that this is maybe where I would fit in, and I did. Another mutant is Linux. You use Linux every day, whether you know it or not. Over 850,000 Android phones running Linux are activated every single day. Compare that to just 30,000 Windows phones, according to the latest reports. That means 100 Android devices have come online just since you started watching this video. Nearly 700,000 TVs are sold every day, most of which are running Linux. Eight out of 10 financial trades are powered by Linux. Nine out of 10 of the world's supercomputers run Linux. Google, Twitter, Facebook, and Amazon are all powered by Linux. So how is Linux developed to achieve all of this? Unlike other operating systems, like Windows or iOS, Linux is built collaboratively across companies, geographies, and markets, resulting in the largest collaborative development project in the history of computing. Just since 2005, about 8,000 developers from almost 800 companies have contributed to the Linux kernel. These contributions have resulted in 15 million lines of code, 1.5 million lines written in just the last couple of years. Consider that Homer's epic Iliad poem is a mere 15,000 lines of text. The novel War and Peace, just 560,000 words. But it's not just about the sheer number of lines of code. It's also about how quickly Linux is developed and released. For example, a major new kernel comes out every two to three months. Compare this to years for competing operating systems. This is made possible by a unique collaborative development process. When submitting code to the Linux kernel, Developers break changes into individual units called patches. A patch describes the lines that need to be changed, added, or removed from the source code. Each patch can add a new feature, new support for a device, fix a problem, improve performance, or rework things to be more easily understood. Developers post their patches to the relevant mailing list, where other developers can reply with feedback. When the patch is close to being release ready, it is accepted by a senior Linux kernel developer or maintainer who manages one or more of 100 different sections of the kernel. While this isn't a guarantee that it will go to the main line, it's certainly a good sign. Here it gets an even more extensive evaluation. When the maintainer finishes their review, he or she will sign off on the patch and send it on to Linux creator and Linux Foundation fellow Linus Torvalds, who has the ultimate authority on what is accepted into the next release and what is not. Nearly 10,000 patches go into almost every new release. About six patches are applied to the kernel each hour. 
Linux's rate of development is simply unmatched. Today, Linux is dominating on mobile devices, in the enterprise and web infrastructure, data centers, supercomputing, and more. What's next? Because together, we're ready. The development of Linux is one of the most prominent examples of free and open source software collaboration. The underlying source code may be used, modified and distributed, commercially or non-commercially, by anyone under licenses such as the GNU, General Public License. Putting Linux out on the net was kind of the natural thing to do in, in many ways. And there were a lot of small reasons, like the fact that that I thought it was a good idea anyway to, to make Linux available to others so that they could try it out and, and send comments back to, to me. Open source is a way for people to collaborate on software without being encumbered by all of the problems of intellectual property, having to negotiate contracts every time you buy a piece of software have a lot of lawyers involved. In general, we just want to get the software to work, and we want to be able to have people contribute fixes to that, etc. So we sort of sacrifice some of the intellectual property rights and just let the whole world use the software. Another mutant is Khan Academy. Khan Academy is a non-profit educational website created in 2006 by educator Salman Khan, a graduate of MIT and Harvard Business School. The stated mission is to provide a free, world-class education for anyone, anywhere. The Khan Academy started with Khan remotely tutoring one of his cousins, interactively using Yahoo Doodle images. Based on feedback from his cousin, additional cousins began to take advantage of the interactive, remote tutoring. In order to make better use of his and their time, Khan transitioned to making YouTube video tutorials. The website supplies a free online education on more than 5,000 different topics like mathematics, history, healthcare, medicine, finance, physics, chemistry, biology, astronomy, economics, cosmology, organic chemistry, American civics, art history, macroeconomics, microeconomics, and computer science. Khan Academy has eclipsed MIT's Open Courseware OCW, in terms of videos viewed. Its YouTube channel has almost 1 billion total views compared to MIT's 10 million. It also has almost three times as many subscribers as MIT's. The organization's content has been translated to other languages for accessibility. There are also translations to the content contributed by volunteers. As of November 2016, Khan Academy has seven official websites in other languages and 20,000 closed caption translations on videos. In addition, Khan Lab School, a school owned by Khan Academy, was opened on September 15, 2014 in Mountain View, California. I, I like the mentorship program because it helps me understand what these kids are thinking and it's really helpful to them and it's nice to know that I can help. We really are a one-room schoolhouse. We have all of our ages together. Right now we're 5 to 13. And it's a very powerful thing because I see it even with my own children at the lab school where, you know, my son's now 6 and there's a 12-year-old who will hold his hand and who will talk to him about how he might want to think about a certain type of problem or why he might wa not want to give up. And it's oftentimes that 12-year-old's intervention or that 10-year-old intervention that means much more to my son than anything I could say or that anything any other adult could say. So some of us are going back and mastering the early concepts like first grade, second grade, third grade math. And then some of us are way up there doing pre-calculus. Before I was really bad at math. Now I'm doing two levels ahead of my math level. When you walk into Con Lab School, I think the nice thing about it is that it feels alive. Um, kids are talking with each other, kids are moving around the space, there's a lot of freedom. It's also unique because um, you know you walk into a traditional school and everyone is facing the same way, the teacher is definitely at the center, but uh, when you walk into Con Lab School I think you'll see the students at the center of their learning, so maybe groups of students who are um, standing over a project together, so I think you would feel the energy and excitement around learning. And there's always a real buzz when you walk into the school. 
Yeah, our, our daughter does not want to leave. Like if I say 520, she'll say, oh, can I, can I, 525? Like, you know, she'll bargain for five minutes. Yeah, everything here is that the kids are doing uh, for a large part of their own volition. And they're doing things because they want to do it. I think it's the creativity and the, and the fact that the kids are basically allowed to do everything that they want to do. My group that I was mentoring decided they wanted to make a hovercraft. And that certainly came from them, because as teachers, none of us have had experience with that. And we're looking at it thinking, golly, okay, that's a beautiful idea. How are we going to support this? Um, and in conversation and talking it through and finding internet resources, we successfully built a hovercraft. And I say we, but they successfully built a hovercraft. They, we had taught them how to use tools, and they, they really figured it out. That blew my mind. They had it done on like week three or something. <laughs> it was really incredible. Here, student ownership of learning is really important. Uh, students, we expect them to see that learning is, it's not something they do for somebody else, it's something they do for themselves and for their future, to realize their own dreams and their own wishes for their lives is, is maybe the most powerful thing we do. I do love my job. I am absolutely passionate about teaching and to be in a place that really supports that and supports me to try new things. It just feels so honest and it feels really, it feels like we're supporting students the best we can um, without getting hung up on anything else. Additional examples are so plentiful that it's almost a common factor amongst all internet computer and collaboration based projects. Facebook, Napster, Google and Windows are just a few examples of teenagers using computers and the internet alone to develop new advanced tools that are now used by billions worldwide. And many of these teenagers quit school or college to follow up on their ideas and put them into practice. Which proves that with no help from school, you can create tremendous and complex tools that billions use worldwide. Earlier this year, I won an international science competition. And ever since then, a bunch of people have come up to me and asked, how on earth could a 15-year-old have come up with a new way to detect pancreatic cancer? My answer, a ton of hard work, a year and a half to be precise, and a ton of failures. Now, recently I developed a novel paper sensor for the detection of pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer. And it's 168 times faster, over 26,000 times less expensive, and over 400 times more sensitive than the current gold standard of detection. The best part, it costs three cents and takes five minutes to run. And my breakthrough came in the most unlikely of places. It came in high school biology class, the absolute like abhorror of like innovation. <laughs> so I basically smuggled in this article on single walled carbon nanotubes I had been dying to read. And a single walled carbon nanotube is essentially an atom thick tube of carbon that's just imagine a really long pipe, and it's 150 thousandth the diameter of your hair. And it has these amazing properties, they're super, super cool. And they're like the superheroes of material science. And so then I was trying to roll over this concept of we were learning about antibodies. And an antibody is basically a lock and key molecule that attaches specifically to a certain protein, in this case, the mesothelin. And I was trying to combine that specific reactivity to how carbon nanotubes are really sensitive to their network, all the um, three-dimensional structures of their network. And then it hit me. What I could do is I could put an antibody in this network, such that it would react specifically to the mesothelin, and then also it would change its electrical properties based on that amount of mesothelin. Enough so that I could measure it with a $50 Home Depot ohm meter. So pretty easy. And just as I had this epiphany, my biology teacher storms up to me because she spotted me reading this article, snatches it out of my hand, and because I was supposed to be writing an essay, and then storms off and gives me a lecture. After class, I finally convinced her after a huge lecture on how I should respect her and her class. 
I finally got my oracle back, because that's all I really want from her. But I've learned a really important lesson over the course of my journey. What I've learned is that through the internet, anything is possible. Theories can be shared, and you don't have to be a professor with multiple degrees to have your values, um, your ideas valued. And regardless of your gender, your age, your ethnicity, regardless of anything, it's just your ideas that count. And to me, that's all that really matters. So redefining relevance for me is looking for new ways to use the internet. We really don't want to see your duck-faced pictures. Instead, you could be changing the world with the internet. You could help detect pancreatic cancer. So if I could detect pancreatic cancer, just imagine what you could do. Elon Musk, the creator of PayPal and now the man behind Tesla, Hyperloop, SpaceX and SolarCity, when asked how he can run such big companies, where is his expertise coming from, he always responds, I read many books. So the internet and computers are just a means to reach a more abundant world of information. Non-experts who have made huge contributions to humanity have been doing this since the era of Aristotle, when the first school systems were invented. However, their purpose was to offer educational materials for those who were interested in finding out more about the world. Actually, the term school means leisure in ancient Greek, which is quite the opposite of what school has now become. Ask Isaac Newton where he got his education because he didn't begin school until the age of 12 and at the age of 17 was removed from school. Later on he did go to Trinity College which was shut down soon after Newton had obtained his degree but that didn't stop him from becoming one of the most brilliant people in the world. He continued his own studies privately at his home in Woolsthorpe over the next two years, bringing together the development of his theories on calculus, optics, and the law of gravitation. The very idea of having the empirical world answer our questions, that idea was taking hold in a way that had almost never done so before. And from a young age, Newton was gripped by this new outlook. As a boy, he pored over a book called The Mysteries of Nature and Art, a manual for building mechanical contraptions and investigating the natural world. He was preoccupied by the things that preoccupy physicists, by time and motion. So he made windmills, he made little boats, he flew kites that supposedly affrighted the locals. He tied candles to them and they were put up and they thought that they were comets. Newton's a very smart guy, and he became convinced that the only types of statements that are acceptable are ones which you could, to put it bluntly, test in the laboratory. But just as Newton was probing the limits of Descartes, the plague struck England. Thousands died every week. The university closed, and Newton returned home to avoid infection. And it was here, in the apple orchard just outside the family home, that the legend of Isaac Newton was born. By the time he was 22 years of age, working on the calculus at uh, Woolstar, he was the greatest mathematician the world had ever seen, and yet no one knew. Only Newton knew, and it was his secret. This was a guy who adored computation of every kind. Among the things that you can see if you open his manuscripts, for instance, is there are places where you'll find he's calculated logarithms out to 50 places and things like that. Not because he needed it, but because he liked doing it. I mean, it was a pleasure to him to do that sort of thing. And if that weren't enough, Newton overturned accepted wisdom about how colors are produced, performing an experiment on himself with a large needle or bodkin. I took a bodkin and put it between my eye and the bone, as near to the back side of my eye as I could. And pressing my eye with the end of it, so as to make the curvature in my eye, there appeared several white, dark, and colored circles. Fortunately, Newton found a safer way to investigate light and color, using a prism. From Aristotle to Descartes, scientists thought sunlight, or white light, was pure. Colors were produced by physically modifying white light, which they believed passing it through a prism did. 
But Newton decided to see for himself. Sending sunlight through a prism, he produced the spectrum of colors. And then he went one step further. He sent the red ray of light through a second prism. Instead of making a new color, it remained red. Newton concluded that white light is not pure, but a combination of all the colors of the rainbow. He thought of the prism actually as a separator of the objects that are all in the original light. This was very hard for almost everybody to swallow because it meant that when you're looking at white light, you're looking at something which has all the colors already in it. This seemed completely counterintuitive, and indeed, frankly, it's counterintuitive to most people today. Only 25 years old, Newton had made some of the most stunning breakthroughs in the history of science, but he kept them almost entirely to himself, just as he had done with calculus. After the plague subsided, he returned to Cambridge, where he worked his way up to an appointment as the Lucasian Professor of Mathematics, the position held by Stephen Hawking today. Or ask Albert Einstein, who didn't like school much at all, how he came up with the theory of relativity or other conceptual aspects of his astonishing work. These were his thoughts about school, I quote, the spirit of learning and creative thought were lost in strict rote learning, end quote. Although Einstein is now considered the epitome of genius, in the first two decades of his life, many people thought Einstein was the exact opposite. Right after Einstein was born, relatives were concerned with Einstein's pointy head. Einstein also failed to impress his teachers. From elementary school through college, his teachers and professors thought him lazy, sloppy, and insubordinate. Some of his teachers even told him that he would never amount to anything. What appeared to be laziness in class was really boredom. Rather than just memorizing facts and dates, the mainstay of classroom work, Einstein preferred to ponder questions such as what makes the needle of a compass point in one direction? Why is the sky blue? What would it be like to travel at the speed of light? And etc. Unfortunately for Einstein, these were not the types of topics he was taught in school. Although his grades were good, Einstein found regular schooling to be strict and oppressive. Things changed for Einstein when he befriended Max Talmud, the 21-year-old medical student who had ate dinner at the Einsteins once a week. Although Einstein was only 11 years old, Max introduced Einstein to numerous science and philosophy books and then discussed their content with him. Einstein flourished in this learning environment and it wasn't long before Einstein had surpassed what Max could teach him. For seven years, Einstein worked six days a week as a patent clerk. He was responsible for examining the blueprints of other people's inventions and then determining whether or not they were feasible. If they were, Einstein had to ensure that no one else had already been given a patent for the same idea. Somehow, between his very busy work and family life, Einstein not only found time to earn a doctorate from the University of Zurich awarded in 1905, but also found time to think. It was while working at the patent office that Einstein made his most shocking and amazing discoveries. This unique color footage shows Einstein in his twilight years. It's May 1943 and Einstein is among friends in the garden of his home in Princeton. He poses awkwardly. The film seems to highlight a more human side of a man who was already by then a scientific icon. And among those that knew the real Einstein was 10-year-old Stephanie Asker. More than 60 years on and we brought her back to the garden. Her memories of the day and the man are as vivid as ever. The one thing I noticed was this tremendously twinkly eyes, I mean like Santa Claus. And, um, but at other times he had extremely sad eyes. He had a very sad look. They say the eyes are the window of the soul, and he had a very deep soul. He really did. My last memory of him, um, I was, it was our last visit, I was 18 and we were looking out over this lovely garden and he just stood there and looked out and he said, one feels one does not deserve such beauty. In a lovely setting, anyone would appreciate it, but he took it to this other philosophical level or spiritual level. That's the kind of person he was, extremely um, 
humble and understood some of the secrets of life. Charles Darwin was a very curious kid who collected animal shells, postal franks, birds, eggs, pebbles and minerals. But his father once told him, I quote, You care for nothing but shooting, dogs and rat catching, and you will be a disgrace to yourself and all your family. End quote. When in college he attended the official university lectures, but complained that most were stupid and boring. He was disgusted by the dull and outdated anatomy lecture. Although he attended a medical university, he had brought natural history books with him, including a copy of A Naturalist Companion by George Graves, bought in August in anticipation of seeing the seaside, and he also borrowed similar books from the library. Darwin wrote to his family home, I quote, I'm going to learn to stuff birds from a black emmer. He only charges one guinea for an hour every day for two months, end quote. Without his curiosity of learning by himself, Darwin probably would never have come up with the theory of evolution. Louis Pasteur was an average student in his early years and not particularly academic. In 1839, he entered the Collège Royale de Bassasson and earned his bachelor degree in 1840. He continued there for a science degree with special mathematics but failed in 1841. He succeeded in 1842 from Dijon with a poor grade in chemistry. Same story goes for Nikolai Tesla. When exam time came, Tesla was unprepared and asked for an extension to study but was denied. He never graduated from the university and did not receive grades for his last semester. What about Galileo? Except for mathematics, Galileo Galilei was bored with university. Galileo's family was informed that their son was in danger of flunking out. A compromise was worked out where Galileo would be tutored full-time in mathematics by the mathematician of the Tuscan court. Galileo's father was hardly overjoyed about this turn of events, since a mathematician's earning power was roughly around that of a musician. But it seemed that this might yet allow Galileo to successfully complete his college education. However, Galileo soon left the University of Pisa without a degree. There is no shortage of such examples of people who became experts by learning on their own and in some cases outright rejected the school system that was holding them back. Citizen science is scientific research conducted in whole or in part by amateur or non-professional scientists, often by crowdsourcing or crowdfunding. Formally, citizen science has been defined as, I quote, the systematic collection and analysis of data, development of technology, testing of natural phenomena, and the dissemination of these activities by researchers on a primarily avocational basis. These groups of people with no particular formal training in any of the fields they study often come up with amazing results and their interest expands from the observation of cyclical events of nature such as effects of global warming on plant and animal life in the different geographical areas to astronomy or protein folding. One great example is Foldit and the idea of integrating the video game notion to benefit humanity and create more such citizen scientists. Think about Angry Birds. People play that game three million hours a day. If we can produce a game that benefits society with that level of engagement, we could change the world in a week. Adrian's first science video game began when biochemists had a problem. To fight diseases, they needed help solving protein puzzles. Computers are terrible at visual puzzles. But humans are great at them. So where could Adrian find a massive workforce? What if he could get the millions of people playing video games to play a different kind of game? And uh, that was the beginning of Folded. It's a 3D puzzle. Instead of birds and bombs, this game would be about protein folding. Proteins are molecules made up of long chains of amino acids. They're the workhorses of our cells, the machinery that keeps our body running. And they fold in thousands of different ways. It's like all the pieces of the protein lock together 
in this sort of puzzle, like Tetris. How they fold will change what they do in your body. Depending on how they fold, they can either form the fibers in your hair or the motors that run your muscles. A misfolded protein can help HIV replicate and cause diseases like cancer. But a well-folded one can help cure diseases. In the lab, scientists can make the long chains of amino acids. But when it comes to folding them up properly, they have trouble. And that's where people playing Fold It come in. Fundamentally, Fold It is a game where we use people to help us understand how to build these molecules to build next generation cures. On May 8, 2008, they released Fold It to the world and waited. The servers crashed within like 24 hours. The public played it and they cared about it and they understood it and it was one of the greatest feelings of my life. Fold It made history and it isn't Angry Birds. With over 300,000 players, this game advances science. It actually adds value to the world. Adrian has completely broken this mold. There are no elves in the Fold It. There's no magic, there are no unicorns, and yet people love it. In 2011, Fold It players solved one of these puzzles in just three weeks. The riddle of a bad protein that helps HIV reproduce. Identifying that structure brings us closer to designing better treatments. So what kind of person plays a game about protein folding? Meet one of the top-ranked Fold It players in the world. He isn't a scientist. He's a ninth grader. Like most 15-year-olds, Michael Tate loves playing around. I play Fold It as often as I can, and I stay on for hours and hours. To boost your score, you have to follow the rules of protein folding. Make the protein compact and avoid empty spaces. These red things are voids that I have to fill in, and I can add rubber bands that bring the protein closer together. And if you make the most hydrogen bonds between everything, you can get the highest score. We thought we'd have to hide the science behind this veneer of a game. And then it was almost like we'd punk them, you know? But it was the opposite. Getting lectures from your teachers, I mean, that's boring. But if the students aren't having fun playing a game, oh my gosh. There are thousands more like Michael, from architects to historians and bankers to organic farmers. They are the crowd. If you think the citizen science efforts cannot be considered reliable, think again. For example, a 2013 study shows that the results coming from citizen science rival experts in analyzing land cover data. And those are not isolated examples. A classic example of this approach is provided by Tim Goers, who posted in his blog a mathematical question and within a matter of days the commentators had solved it. This gave birth to the Polymath Project, an online effort to solve some very complicated mathematical problems. This is one of the world's most renowned mathematicians. He's a professor at Cambridge University and a recipient of the Fields Medal often called the Nobel Prize of Mathematics. Gowers is also a blogger. And in January of 2009, he used his blog to pose a very striking question. Is massively collaborative mathematics possible? So what he was proposing in this post was to use his blog to attack a difficult, unsolved mathematical problem, a problem which he said he would love to solve, completely in the open, using his blog to post his ideas and his partial progress. What's more, he issued an open invitation inviting anybody in the world who thought that they had an idea to contribute to post their idea in the comments section of the blog. Over the next 37 days, 27 different people would post 800 substantive comments containing 170,000 words. At the end of the 37 days, Gowers used his blog to announce that they had solved the core problem. In fact, they had solved a harder generalization of the problem. The Polymath Project had succeeded. So what the Polymath Project suggests, at least to me, is that we can use the internet to build tools that actually expand our ability to solve the most challenging intellectual problems. Or to put it another way, we can build tools which actively amplify our collective intelligence in much the same way as for millennia, 
we've used physical tools to amplify our strength. Imagine people killing viruses instead of random nonsensical game characters. Imagine solving the biological aging puzzle or the cancer puzzle instead of puzzles that have no effect in the real world. Or imagine that your teachers are the best players helping you in a strategy game, but instead of building random buildings, for example, or environments, you're building real models that can be applied in the real world. Besides Folded, there are other examples of such games. Such an example is ETRNA. In ETRNA, the goal is to coax RNA molecules into specific shapes. The best designs are then synthesized in the lab and scored. Another example is eyewire. Eyewire is attempting to map the brain, starting with the connections between retinal neurons. Another example is Philo. A player might not identify Philo as anything more than a casual game. In actuality though, the different colored squares represent DNA nucleotides, and the game is using human pattern recognition to form multiple sequence alignment. One more example is called The Cure, which is working on developing a genomics-driven predictor of breast cancer prognosis. Another one is called Citizen Sort, which is a collection of three different games that are used to classify and characterize different animal species. This sorting allows researchers to identify and name newly discovered animals. There are even games that use real-life organisms for educational purposes. So the system in particular we used in the museum is shown here, so it's a different magnification that you just saw before, so rather than interacting with a swarm of cells, you interact with a, with a single one. So the user has basically drawn uh, a circle of light and this in the individual cell is then kind of captured uh, inside, right? Whenever it's kind of hitting the, the light, uh, it turns around. So just showing this again, so watch this cell swimming here, and then you see the light, and as soon as it hits the light, it kind of Tones. And now you can do different things. Uh, you can, for example, do simple color experiments. Um, for example, which colors the cell really respond to. If you draw with red light, you start realizing that the cells just swim through. The same thing with uh, green light. So they're not, not very sensitive to that. But as soon as you use blue light as before, then the cells um, uh, start turning around. And you can actually try um, even to draw to the f over the front and the back of the cell and see where the eye spot is. And it's actually a little bit uh, a harder experiment to do due to uh, lag of the projector and other things. But we really enable something, or we're close to enabling something where you can do subcellular experiments uh, in some sort of museum uh, setting. Right? You can also uh, try to make games on, on that platform. So again, we have a virtual object which is overlaid. And here the kind of the interaction is more indirect, right? Where you can draw a certain barriers and then hope that the cell somehow bounces off the barrier and uh, uh, captures uh, those objects. Right? And so lots of interesting questions now. I mean, how do you effectively uh, design games on, on, on a platform uh, like this? What kind of uh, game mechanisms lend themselves well? Here's another game uh, where you get points by getting the most cells into the box. Uh, and uh, if you just draw a circle, that's maybe not very effective. If you draw a bigger circle and make the circle smaller and smaller over time, you, you can uh, corral them. Right? And these are kind of very simple games, a kind of more demonstration type, but it's also the kind of thing that works well in, in a museum setting. And finally, this is kind of a prototyping stage, uh, which we started with the Exploratorium. Rather than drawing on a screen, using a Kinect uh, to project your body shape onto these cells, right? and then projecting everything uh, large on the screen. And then you can see how basically this human interacts with these cells, kind of with the whole uh, body shape. And so it's interesting because it really brings, in that case, cells at kind of the level, at the scale of humans. But if you then look through the microscope, you actually see a little person dancing in there. And so kind of you bring yourself also, you shrink yourself down to the level of, of this microscope and you can, can interact with them. You can also do things on a, on a totally different uh, time scale and also length scale. So this is a Petri dish, it's actually more macroscopic. And what you see in yellow is a, a slime mold, it's called Fusarum. And in red you see where a robot actually uh, places a food solution. And you can see initially this organism forages for food, finds it and then always is kind of tracking uh, this uh, food trail that is laid out. And uh, here actually this whole experiment that you see takes about a day. 
uh, to run and uh, it takes an image of, of about every 10 minutes. We also built a, a cloud lab for that so that students could online and do these types of experiments and actually it was a Lego robot that, that executes these, these things so it's kind of schematized here. What you see here um, are computers, right, and if you compare the two, take to the two pictures you should see a number of, of differences, right. There's uh, Maybe you just take a moment and um, think for yourself. So this is basically a 50 year difference. Computers have advanced a lot in terms of how good they are, how easy they are uh, to use. And you can also sum it up in saying like these were primarily about number crunching and this is really about an in interactive experience um, that even children uh, can have these days. And if you look at biotechnology, what's going on there, we can actually see many um, similarities in that uh, we now have microfluidic devices that are integrated that even have like valves on it similar like like transistors and you can move fluids around in, in small droplets and make diagnostics uh, and other things happening and similar like the image in the background these are kind of still hard to use devices um, they are not as powerful yet as we wish hope to but um, they get increasingly better and we can really wonder what will happen in 10 years 50 years will we have basically the same interactivity and, and the ease of use as we now have with our electronic devices. Another interesting idea is to combine the human experience with knowledge and technology. Imagine a spaceship on Earth, one that perfectly simulates a trip to nearby planets. So instead of being connected to a virtual world through a pair of smart glasses, you can experience it as if it was real. Imagine you and your friends embarking into this Earth grounded yet futuristic spaceship and take a trip to the nearby planets for a few weeks. Although you remain on the ground, I bet you will quickly forget that and feel like you are experiencing a real trip to Mars or the edge of the universe. Within such a simulation, your interaction with your friends and even with the planets, nebulas or stars seen through the viewport would seem quite realistic, since if you were to take such a journey in reality, the spaceship would always be between you and the rest of the universe, with you experiencing it through the spaceship window. Humans can simulate scenarios so well that many people watch movies as if they were part of the action. Or remember your childhood when you imagined you were a superhero and your home was your spaceship. We often re-experience such feelings when playing with our children. You can explore tons of virtual environments as if you were there, in the ship that you are already cruising, looking and exploring the real world. If the power of games and the creativeness of crowds isn't enough to provide for an educated society, then artificial intelligence should help a lot. For example, IBM's Watson. If you're not familiar with Watson's software system and you don't have the time to learn more about it, then just keep in mind a few facts about this intelligent machine. The system was brought onto the US-based game show Jeopardy against two of the best players in the world and won by a huge margin, proving how well he understands and manages human language and concept abstraction. Now it is being used in medical healthcare to research hundreds of thousands of scientific papers and prescribe treatments for patients. He is basically a very smart AI, artificial intelligence machine, that is becoming more and more intelligent with each day passing. Perhaps you've heard of Siri or Google Now though, small scale AIs with which you can basically talk using your smartphone to give them instructions to various software tasks. Send an email, find a route, schedule an appointment, or even ask what is the distance from Earth to the Moon. Now combine the power of Watson with the wide accessibility of smartphones and high-speed internet with abundant information and you have a teacher in your pocket. Actually, you will have all teachers combined in your pocket. Why struggle to memorize facts when every fact known to humanity is at your disposal? With near instant feedback from such a powerful AI, you can bet people will become more and more informed such technologies can also be used with virtual reality headsets to be more close to reality than a digital game. But the power of Watson is zero without the vast human knowledge from which Watson selects, interprets and learns. So people learn new information and feed sources like Wikipedia and such. 
AI like Watson then learns from them and becomes an expert in many fields, which in turn then helps make people smarter. One day you might be able to tell Watson what kind of website or app you want in a natural spoken language and have him build it for you using any programming language you prefer or whatever is best to use for that new resource. And such an app will be your tool for learning even more about the world. Think about news being presented to you in the way that you would understand it. Let's say you like sports and the AI knows that. He will try to present the news clearly by making sports analogies so you understand it better. Short movies and stories can be created with the use of AI and be customized for individuals to better grasp the information. Another very powerful and efficient idea is to embed the contribution of people to education by seamless methods and technologies. Here's an example, if you have signed in to basically anything on the internet these days, then you're most likely familiar with the whole reCAPTCHA program. That's the thing where you have to prove you're not a spam bot by typing some nearly unreadable words into a text box. What you may not know is that by using it, you have most likely contributed to the translation of thousands of old books and documents. In 2009, Google and a couple of other companies had a problem. They wanted to digitalize years of old newspapers and books using software that can read the print, OCR or optical character recognition and then convert it into actual text. But even the most advanced computers had problems reading some of the poor quality scans because the text was smudged or crooked or in a font that has been out of use for years. So they simply placed those unreadable words in between you and whatever you want to access and told you that you'd need to translate them before going any further. Spam bots can't read them because reCAPTCHA uses only the words that the computers already said they couldn't read. It's as brilliant as it is simplistic. The project has been a huge success managing to digitalize 20 years of the New York Times daily newspaper in just a few months, for example, by letting web surfers decode the hard bits. It is estimated that websites display 200 million recaptures a day. Also consider the idea of distributed computing, which has been used to discover new planets, find Mersenne prime numbers or process radio signals to detect alien transmissions. The process is very simple. People all over the world install a screensaver that runs some calculations for these projects when their computers are idle. Thousands of computer hours have been used in this way for research. Well, I'm one of the co-founders of SETI at Home and I'm also the director of the Boink project which uh, develops the software that's used by SETI at Home. When we designed SETI at Home, we were trying to figure out if we had a chance of actually getting enough computing power to do something scientifically useful. We figured the threshold would be 50,000 computers. If we, if we got that many, we could do science that we couldn't do otherwise. And within, oh, probably two or three months, we had a million computers, uh, 20 times more than we thought. Of course, that created a lot of problems with, with uh, beefing up our servers to handle that many. I do remember there was this one day when we came in in the morning and looked at our, our, our database and saw how much computing had been, had been done in the last 24 hours, and it was 1,000 years. A thousand years of computing time in one day. And we, we sort of sat back and, you know, let that sink in, and at that point we realized that we were really onto something. For example, the, the climate prediction computing has jobs that run for, for weeks or months. By and large, the other projects are cranking out research at a, at a kind of the conventional rate and uh, publishing papers. There's a project called Einstein at Home that uh, used volunteer computing and found a whole bunch of new pulsars. Pulsars that are part of binary systems, a very, very exciting kind of pulsar. Um, the biomedical projects um, uh, I, I, I can't tell you that they've cured cancer or anything like that, but uh, they have published papers in journals like Science and Nature at a, at a pretty good clip. So there's a lot of real science getting done with volunteer computing. Another exciting thing recently has been porting everything to run on smartphones, Android phones in particular, which are, you know, in some ways are the future of consumer electronics. They're not going to replace desktop computers, but there will be more of them. There are more of them currently. Um, and they're becoming very powerful and um, very capable of doing scientific computing. 
You may think that mathematics, physics, biology or any such disciplines are so hard for people to fully grasp and because of that few engage in such topics. What if our society were to experience just one single change, that science becomes the coolest thing for people to discuss? Instead of discussing politics, music, movies or sports, people would find scientific subjects as their main interest. How would that change society as a whole? People gossip about other people all the time. They know hundreds of movies and remember thousands of situations from those movies along with the characters presented. They watch so much sports and memorize so many complex statistics. People remember jokes and folks, celebrity gossips and faraway friendships. There is no reason to think that people are not able to retain lots of information and use it for all kinds of purposes. They often become fanatic about a football team, a religious dogma, a musician or a Hollywood star. But what if they instead became fanatic about atoms, galaxies, DNA, stars, the history of science, mathematics, chemistry and so on? How would that change us as a society? Engaging in conversations and getting feedback, reinforcement seems to have a deep impact on retaining and understanding information. I always wondered how it would be if every time I go out with my friends instead of discussing about a football team, how wasted they were last night, about movies or a crime they saw on TV, we instead discuss the most recently discovered exoplanets, relativity because it's quite a hard concept to grasp, new technologies or the universe as a whole. Just think about it. Movies and TV shows have so much success in the world, but the majority of them are based on fiction and gossip, turning their viewers into beings with little or no grasp of the amazing reality around them. What if movies were about real scientific events? What if TV shows were more factual than fictional? After all, if you want endless stories and complex ideas, just look at reality. From quarks to quasars, living cells to black holes, Galileo to Einstein, the real world story is far beyond any story, movie, book or idea. Imagine instead of some invented drama movie, we choose to watch a movie about the life of Nikolai Tesla, or instead of science fiction movies, we watch movies about the discovery of quarks, atoms and DNA, the building blocks of us and everything around and inside us. The drama that Galileo lived through to prove that the sky isn't perfect and the curiosity which led him to first observe a wandering star through a telescope and realize it was a world like ours. Ancient Greeks like Aristotle who tried to figure out the world around them. The life and findings of Copernicus and Kepler. The mind-blowing discoveries of Darwin which led him to the theory of evolution. Einstein's quest to prove that space has a shape. The invention of chemistry and biology the discovery of tectonic plates and how the earth moves beneath our feet, although we don't normally feel that. Edward Hubble's discovery of our galaxy being just one of billions of galaxies out there and that the universe is continuously expanding at an ever increasing rate. The existence of so many creatures in the world as well as the ones that have become extinct dinosaurs for instance. The revelation of quantum physics, the discovery of neutrinos, the development of the many amazing technologies which contributed to the human quest of discovering the world. I bet many people don't even have the slightest idea of the fascinating complexity of our world, the drama that unfolds behind scientific endeavor, the out of this world findings or the excitement of new discoveries. I am so curious of how humanity and our surroundings would evolve if exposed to such media materials as much as the fake information we are provided with today. But why stop at movies and TV shows? What about cartoons depicting real properties of nature? Consider atoms and how hard it seems for people to remember their properties or how they react with each other. What if you transform them into cartoon characters like these and their chemical properties into so-called powers? The way they interact with each other can be based on the same principle. Or if kids were to watch amazing documentaries like Planet Earth, Frozen Planet, Nature's Most Amazing Events, Life or The Blue Planet instead of nonsense TV shows. Look closely at the news today and you will rarely find science there. What if the news were more science oriented, removing all the crimes, violence or nonsense gossip from their menu? 
I am so curious how a world influenced by such a media would look like, aren't you? When people hear the word play, they usually associate it with childish play or something that is not serious, but play is actually the engagement with life and situations in life which should be experienced in a comfortable manner. That's why it is playing and not struggling. When we were kids, we eagerly explored the world around us. I remember when sometimes I would close my eyes for an entire day to try to feel how a blind person experiences life. Sometimes I wouldn't use my right hand, just to see if I could handle daily tasks with only the left hand. I played with my friends all day long, and sometimes we observed ants and put small obstacles in their path to see how they would react. More recently in my life, this idea of play hasn't lost its meaning, just some of its means. I now play with computer programs and because of that I have learned how to design websites. I read to explore new ideas and sometimes enjoy snorkeling to observe marine life and learn more about it. Because of this attitude of playing I was able to create a 14 hour long documentary, Trom, by myself. I wrote the script, translated it from Romanian to English, did all the video, audio, photo editing, developed the website and doing all of the promotion for it. As a result of it being so successful, I've met many new wonderful beings and felt encouraged to work on other such projects like Videoneat, a website full of lectures, documentaries and science based movies. So am I a movie producer, scriptwriter, journalist, web designer and so on? How can I do SEO design, video photo audio editing, manage projects and much more? I never learned these things in school, yet I am able to do them and even get huge positive feedback. And I am a light example, there are people doing mind-blowing projects and accomplishing extraordinary tasks with no help from school, just out of the pure excitement and enjoyment of play. The present educational system seems to be obsolete. Its methods of mandatory learning, the unresearched means of teaching, the mandatory schedule and the stigmatization of children through grades and tests. Money also plays a huge role in education. The school books and other educational materials are very hard to update with new information because of the costs involved. So what is taught in school today may already be very outdated. Also teachers and students seem to be primarily motivated by the money and not by learning. As a result teachers may not care about their teaching methods nearly as much as their monthly paychecks. While students may only care about getting a diploma or degree in order to get a better paying job or at least whatever job it is so that he or she can survive in this world. This entire educational system completely kills the joy of exploring. Actually, it doesn't even intend to care about that. Imagine not being forced to go to school. Wouldn't you take the play idea more seriously? Wouldn't you be curious exploring the world, learning more, creating interesting projects, helping others and so on? As we have seen, the means by which you can do that are so plentiful. With an internet connection today, you gain access to any human knowledge in multiple flavors. We can think of such a world where since infancy, every human being is exposed to a smart environment, smart technology and powerful scientific information. The play would never end and he or she will not only have the means of fulfilling their hunger for knowledge, but also create new means by which it can be accomplished. The entire human race, connected through networks, like the internet using multiple devices like computers, tablets, smartphones, etc. and multiple means feeding a global human knowledge base, which in turn feeds them back and creates continual widespread innovation. We all must be citizen scientists and the means through which we play should be plentiful, not just tasteful for some. Whether it's games, TV shows, extraordinary CGI movies, lectures, explorations, conversations, the leisure to explore alone, or with groups or like-minded people, through sport, music, dancing or whatever suits you, you should be allowed to choose how and when you want to play. And through today's amazing technology, you will create value no matter what. Some more than others, some faster than others, some will be the first, some may be the last, some may create the knowledge, some may enjoy taking it in, some may do both.
In my mind, it should not matter what you explore or when you explore it. It's like the internet, the abundance of people ensure that there are more than enough people researching all necessary fields of science. Some may still enjoy this present schooling system and they should be able to attend one. We may see experts in defined fields, biology, astronomy, etc. And also those who know a good amount from each field. We may see teachers and students becoming the same entity and we may also be assisted by powerful AI. All those students are in the class. Now you ask me, how should I best teach them? Should I teach them from the point of view of the history side, from the applications? My theory is that the best way to teach is to have no philosophy, is to be chaotic and confuse it in the sense that you use every possible way of doing it. That's the only way I can see to answer it, so as to catch this guy or that guy on different hooks as you go along. That during the time when the fellow who was interested in the history is being bored by the abstract mathematic, on the other hand, the fellow who likes the abstraction is being bored at another time by the history. If you can do it so you don't bore them all, all the time, perhaps you're better off. When I was a boy, of my father telling me things, so I tried to tell my son things that were interesting about the world. We, uh, when he was very small, I used to rock him to bed, you know, when he goes to bed, I'd tell him stories. And I'd make up story about little people that were about so high, would walk along, I would go on picnics and so they lived in the ventilator. And they'd go through these woods, which had great, big, long, tall, blue things like trees, but without leaves and only one stalk. And they were an all, and they had to walk between them and so on. And he'd gradually catch on, that was the rug, the nap of the rug, the blue rug. And he loved this game because I would describe all these things from an odd point of view and he liked to hear the stories and we got all kinds of wonderful things. He even went into a moist cave where the wind kept going in and out. It was coming in cool and went out warm and so on. It was inside the dog's nose that they went. And then of course I could tell him all about physiology by this way and so on. And he loved that and so I told him lots of stuff and I enjoyed it because I was tell him stuff that I liked and we had fun when he would guess what it was and so on. And then I had a daughter and I tried the same thing. Well, my daughter's personality was different. She didn't want to hear the story. She wanted the story that was in the book repeated again and read, read to her. She wanted me to read to her, not to make up story. That's a different personality. You asked me if an ordinary person, by studying hard, would get to be able to imagine these things like I imagine. Of course, I was an ordinary person who studied hard. There's no miracle, people. It just happens they got interested in this thing and they learned all this stuff. They're just people. There's no talent, a special miracle ability to understand quantum mechanics or a miracle ability to imagine electromagnetic fields that comes without practice and reading and learning and study. So if you say you take an ordinary person who's willing to devote a great deal of time and study and work and thinking and mathematics and time and then he's become a scientist. As I see it, education will, or at least should, become this chaotic soup, but organized at its deep core, with people from all around the world being more and more engaged in decentralized knowledge seeking and the continual production of it. When people have so many means to get educated and the information becomes more and more scientific, their experience and expertise can be easily harnessed for all of humanity. That, in turn, continuously feeds more and more advanced knowledge back into the system. What a fantastic feedback loop! But as long as people are forced to get a job to survive in this world, it will remain as a forced education, which is nothing more than a form of voluntary, and in most cases involuntary, mental and physical enslavement that gives up on most important aspects of being human. In other words, one's curiosity. In a world like the one proposed by us, trade-free, the methods of creation and naturally harnessing the knowledge of all people will explode. What would be the result, I'm wondering? I want you to imagine today an island where all students learn about science by doing science. I want you to, I want you to imagine an island where every adult, regardless of their profession, is helped with some discovery. I want you to imagine an island 
where we consider the world to be a question that each person struggles to help answer in better and better ways each day. So I, I started to think about an island like this one when I was writing my first book, Every Living Thing, about biological discovery. And one of the themes that comes up again and again in this book is the idea that we tend to think that we know most of what can be known, that we live in this egg of knowledge around which there's a patina of unknown. And again and again in the history of science, what happens is that that egg breaks, breaks open and we're proven to be far more ignorant than we think that we are. The way we teach them about science today is the same way we taught in the dark ages. Somebody holds open a book and reads, and the students look for what they've been told about. That is literally what we did in the dark ages. How about instead we teach students that somebody holds up, open a book and reads, and they look at something about the world, and they look for what we don't know. That's possible, and it's possible in a way that wasn't possible several generations ago, several decades ago, because of the powerful tools we all have in our pockets. We can now connect classrooms with these amazing computers. We can use these computers to look out. We mostly use these to take selfies. But what if we turn them around and use them to take otheries? I think that the light that these tools offer us is incredible if used wisely. The light that they offer us allows us to think about an island, an island that is the whole earth. When we look at a map like this, we mostly th think about the horror of the fact that we're so dense on the planet. These are our lights at night, but these are also the lights of our ingenuity, the lights of our curiosity, and they're the places where we can shine a light directly on the place we live and understand more about it. And so let us comprehend this island as a question. What Terry Irwin, the biologist, showed us is that we all wake up in the darkness of our own ignorance. But what I believe is that together with our humble lights, these humble lights, that we can look out and at the end of each, each day see more together than we could ever see at the beginning on our own.